Well, I'd like to thank you all for allowing me to come tonight. Uh, Brendan mentioned I run the WinLink Wednesday Net, and uh, to call me a cheerleader for WinLink might be an understatement. So when Brendan asked me if I would be willing to come to a presentation for you, there was no way I could say no. So here I am jumping at the chance. So when I go through the, I have kind of a lot of material to cover. I'm going to try and cover it quickly. I'm going to ask you two things. Number one, if you have a question, ask yourself, can this wait to the end? If you absolutely think it cannot wait to the end, then go ahead and raise your hand. I don't mind being interrupted, but let's get through the material. Where's the restroom? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, the, I'm not going to comment on that. Um, so if it can wait to the end, please do. Uh, if you do ask it, I may tell you, please hold it because we're going to cover that. But uh, So do your best and try and... Uh, be considerate of everybody's time so we can get home at a reason, reasonable hour tonight and we'll try and get through this material. Um, every presentation I've ever been to, the presenter always starts off with uh, a slide that tells their whole curriculum vitae and why they're qualified to be there standing in front of you that night. And I am going to give you a little information about me, but i really like to know a little bit about my audience. So I'd like to start with a little about you, if you don't mind. So we're doing a little bit of audience participation tonight. And I'm going to ask you by a show of hands to self-identify where you are on the WinLink spectrum. And you didn't even know you were on a spectrum, did you? So who is in the category of what is WinLink? Anybody here? Well, good. I hope we can treat you, t treat you to some interesting information tonight, OK? How about the next group? I've heard of WinLink. OK, we got a, wow, we got a good group. All right. How about I use WinLink occasionally? All right, good, good, all right. Uh, who uses WinLink frequently? Brendan, you have to raise your hand. Obviously, I have to raise my hand, right? I only get between 350 and 400 Win WinLink messages per month, so I think that qualifies me as a frequent user. And one final category, who uh, manages a WinLink gateway? I have an audience planned here. I asked Lee to come <laughs> because I was desperately afraid somebody was going to ask me some sysop question that I wasn't going to know the answer to. So. Uh, Lee was kind enough to show up, and uh, he'll be armed with information if it's something that I don't have uh, the answer to. So anyway, thank you for letting me know a little bit about my audience. I'm glad that we have a, a broad spectrum of, of knowledge. Hopefully, there'll be a little bit for everybody tonight. A little bit about me. Uh, you've already heard my name is Greg Butler. My call sign is KW6GB, and I'll bet you know where I came here from. Uh, I was originally licensed in 1972. As a young teen, I lived in uh, northern New Jersey. My grandfather was in Southern California, and he said, Greg, you should get your amateur radio license. So I did my study in, and I went down the street to a neighbor's house and took my novice test. And then I really didn't do anything with it because I was a young teenage boy, <laughs> and life happened. So. Uh, you know, I let that license expire, life happened, I uh, finished my education, uh, started working, got married, had a family, uh, and settled into my careers. Uh, just a, a little bit uh, about my working background. I was a construction electrician for a dozen years, so I really appreciated the, the pre-meeting information, uh, a subject near and dear to my heart. I held a, uh, a drafting business that I ran for seven years after that. And then I worked for 18 years at the local building department in a city in Southern California where I started out at the front counter, helping people with their applications and signing all the papers necessary to get their permits. Eventually became the department manager and I was doing most of the plan review. Ultimately became the building and safety director. And when I retired 18 years after I started there, I was the building official and emergency manager. One of the things that I learned when I worked for a city in Southern California is that under California law, Everybody that works for a municipality or any, any government office in California is considered a disaster service worker, which means something big happens and something big is going to happen in California, as we all know. <laughs> they can hold you over. They can call you back in. So uh, some of my duties included some responsibilities in our emergency operations center. So uh, I used that time to uh, think about the education that I had so far. I had fiddled around a lot in junior college, had a bunch of credits and decided I want to go ahead and, and complete my bachelor's degree. So I was 50 years old by the time I completed my bachelor's degree, which was the same year my daughter finished her master's degree. <laughs> so, you know, I got to share that with her. Um, but uh, at my commencement, I had a professor encourage me to pr pursue my master's. Uh, I, I, I think I'm kind of a teacher by heart. 
Uh, maybe not for the paperwork side of it, but I enjoy sharing knowledge with folks and helping them along with uh, whatever they need help with. And, in, and lately it's been WinLink and I love that. But um, so I did decide to go ahead and pursue my master's degree. And so I, I uh, completed a master of arts degree in emergency and emergency and man. I can say this. I have it. <laughs> it says so on the paper, emergency and disaster management. I uh, completed that at uh, American Military University in 2014, and I think within a month and a half of that, I uh, retired. So, uh, so, and then within seven days of retiring, I uh, escaped California and moved full-time to Virginia, and uh, I've never looked back. I love being here. The people in Virginia are so nice, so uh, I just appreciate the welcome that my wife and I have been given. During my uh, graduate studies, uh, I had the chance to uh, do a specific study uh, about earthquakes in California, and it made me realize that uh, I really needed to have amateur radio as part of my personal emergency preparedness. So I got back in the hobby in 2010 and was able to pass my technician and general uh, tests at the same seating. And then during a break in school about a year later, uh, I was able to pass my amateur extra exam and decided that it was time to get a a call sign that was specific to my license class and then of course when I moved here I thought about changing it but you know a six call kind of stands out here so I'm leaving it as it is. Uh, I wanted to get involved in amateur radio the moment I got here so I started looking around and I got involved in my local emergency communications group and also in Aries and a few people asked me to take over some jobs that they were doing and so I'm currently the very the Aries uh, district emergency coordinator for District 1, which encompasses Frederick County, Clark County, Warren County, Shenandoah County, and uh, Page County, so the northern end of the Shenandoah Valley. So that's where I, what I bring to you. Uh, I, I don't know much about where you guys are, and I'm sure you face different situations than I do. I know when I drove out here today, I was lamenting all those folks that were driving eastbound on 66, and it just made me glad I live in the country. So, <laughs> Yes, I'm a long way from Trader Joe's, but you know, that's the price you pay. All right, so I told you I came from Southern California, and of course, a number of the people that I met when I first got here couldn't figure out why I'd want to move from a paradise like Southern California. You know, it's got all the beaches, it got San Diego, and of course, everybody wanted to know where I was relative to San Diego, because that's the place they seemed to know. And I was actually out in the desert, um, I was out in a place called La Quinta, which is near, the nearest city of, that anybody knows about is Palm Springs. And uh, I can tell you that it, when we're all plowing and shoveling snow in February here, Palm Springs is the place to be when it's 70 degrees. Um, you know, croquet on the lawn for New Year's Eve was a common thing at our house. So anyway. Uh, on July 15th? Oh, <laughs> the highest I ever saw in July was 128 degrees. So. Uh, you know, and they always say, but it's a dry heat. And I say, <laughs> right? But, I, but my response to that is, you know, my oven's dry heat too, but I don't put my head in there intentionally. So, <laughs> so anyway, so yeah, a lot of people think I was in paradise. However, you know, every place that's paradise has its downside. Anybody know what that red line represents? Brendan, you're not allowed to. Okay, <laughs> good deal. You're right, it is the San Andreas Fault. And as you probably know, and I learned in my master's degree studies, the San Andreas Fault has a major quake about every 150 years. The southern section of the San Andreas Fault, which is shown on the map, it's been about 300 years since the last one. And when they say major earthquake, they're talking about a magnitude 7.8. Um, the unique thing about my specific location, so I've zoomed in here, and I was in the town of La Quinta, and I'm probably standing right in the way of some of you folks, right? I'll try and move around a little bit so everybody gets a chance. Um, my house was about 12 and a half miles from the San Andreas Fault. Um, my, before I started my master's degree, my emergency preparedness plan included abandoning my house, which was of mediocre construction, and driving Interstate 10 toward Phoenix and ending up at my sister-in-law's house in Tucson, which was a great plan until I realized from my master's studies that the San Andreas Fault crosses Interstate 10, and the, and the studies they've done on the, the, uh, what they call the shakeout scenario quake anticipates a 27-foot permanent horizontal displacement of Interstate 10 in the valley in which I lived. So I thought, well, that plan's not going to work very well. So I decided to be a little better prepared to uh, stay where I was because I figured the big one's going to happen 
the 9 million people in the Los Angeles Basin are going to get the, the media attention, the resources, and everything else that we needed. So I was prepared to camp out in place in the desert in the summer for at least two weeks. So think about the supplies you might need for that, and I probably had them. All right? But amateur radio was a big part of that because uh, I realized it was going to be very difficult. So that study helped me just think through uh, the things that we do to prepare for emergencies. So, you know, just think through the kinds of emergencies that you might encounter and think about, tell, you know, in your own mind, think about what kind of preparations you'd make. So as examples of some of the kinds of emergency preparedness we do. So you might, you know, simple thing, like you might be out on the road and have a flat tire and uh, you need to know how to change your tire. And it's one of the things that I made my daughter demonstrate that she can do before I let her drive alone. Just a simple thing like that. It all adds up. Now that I live in Virginia, I'm literally at the end of the power company's power lines. So um, it's less of a problem today than it was when I moved here three years ago. But if power goes out, I at least have a generator that operates off of gasoline or propane. And so I have some key circuits through a legal transfer switch, thank you very much, uh, <laughs> to power some of the key circuits in my house if we have a, a problem like that. And of course, my amateur radio equipment is part of that. Um, hopefully, we can do just a little bit better than this for a, a communications emergency. And of course, amateur radio is a big part of that. Um, but what you'll find is people have uh, prepared for emergency communications in a variety of ways. Some people still have a copper wireline landline phone, right? Other people, they have a cell phone. There's disadvantages and advantages to each, right? The, the, the landline phone gets its power from the central office, so you know that even if the power's out, your phone line might work unless it came down in, in the storm. Cell phone's advantage is it's with you wherever you go. Uh, other people have decided, now I don't know if you're familiar with this, but many jurisdictions in California, actually I think all of them, and all the jurisdictions in Virginia use a, an application called Web EOC. Web EOC is a web-based application that allows us to communicate with um, Virginia Department of Emergency Management to give things like situation updates. I know some of you have actually seen Web EOC. When I was in California, they expected me to use it there as well. The ironic thing to me was I was on the opposite side of the San Andreas Fault from the city of Riverside, which is where our county EOC was. And I figured after that big earthquake, you know, the day I'm going to need Web EOC the most, it's not going to work for me. So, excuse me? Well, and we had huge terrain issues because between where I was living and Riverside, we had the 10,000 foot plus tall San Jacinto Mountains. <laughs> well, that was something that was in use. Anyway, Web EOC is a thing that people use. It, it, <clears throat> the, the challenging part is, is jurisdictions and agencies that have those kinds of devices think that they've got redundancy. So let's look for just a moment at a definition for redundancy. One definition is, one definition is the inclusion of extra components that are not strictly necessary to functioning in case of failure of, in other components. So you have a landline phone, it stops working, chances are your cell phone might, or vice versa, right? It's a way to think about it. You know, if I'm out here in Warren County and I'm trying to get communication to Richmond and the phone lines are all dead, oh, well, maybe I can use Web EOC. What people fail to realize is that what they think are redundant solutions maybe aren't. You guys know what the common thread in all those previous three solutions were? Telephone system, right? All your backbone internet stuff is through uh, telephone uh, media, whether it's copper or fiber or whatever. So I've had to educate a few agencies that they think they have redundancy because they've got, you know, fax machine and phone and all this stuff. And so they don't. So they all rely on telephone infrastructure. And when it fails, they're going to be a problem. So as we all know, because there are so many connection points, there's plenty of opportunities for uh, a, the telephone infrastructure to be damaged and have an interruption. So some people go beyond that and it, this solves at least part of that problem. Obviously if you're calling somebody at a landline phone from your satellite phone, at least one end is going to be working when the, when the telephone infrastructure is down, but you still have that risk of the other end. Of course you could call another satellite phone user and then you'd be okay. 
the real downside that I see to that, and we had two of these phones at the city that I worked for in Southern California. The two problems I see is number one, you have the ongoing uh, cost of maintaining a, 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 a line. And second of all, do you use it enough that when you really need it, number one, the is the battery going to be charged? And number two, do you remember how to use the, use the device? It's a real problem because if you don't practice these things on a regular basis, it's just not going to be there when you need it. So, of course, all of our jurisdictions make uh, big use of land mobile radio systems, and they're great. I wouldn't want to live without it. That's the way my, my police department and, and my fire department and EMS are all dispatched, and it's good. They have limitations on their ability, just like any other uh, typically VHF device. So, of course, we have repeated systems, and, of course, everybody wants interoperability. So they end up building a system that's got all these capabilities, and what do you see up there? Read in, I don't want you to have to read anything. What am I trying to illustrate here? It's a complicated system, or it's at least a complex system. And again, it's got lots of opportunities for points of failure. So amateur radio provides another means of that. Now, you guys all know this already, I'm sure, right? Because that's what we do is we, one of the things that we do is we offer to help out a jurisdiction by saying, hey, look, when all your communications fail, there is amateur radio. I mean, we keep saying when all else fails, right? So let's look at some of the tools that we have in amateur radio. Voice is good. It's one of the tools we have. I want to tell you that voice is great for tactical because it's right now, right there. I can say, Brendan, I need you to go over there and monitor what's happening. And doing that by voice in a tactical situation is great. I'm going to suggest that it may, voice may be less uh, beneficial for logistical concerns. Uh, during my master's program, one of my professors told me a story that they were getting a team ready to deploy to go help out in some disaster. So they phoned in this big list of supplies they needed, and they're waiting, waiting, waiting. And they thought, it should have been here by now. And they make a follow-up phone call to find out why it's taken so long to get the real basic materials that they needed. And, and the, the voice at the other end of the line said, we have everything we need except one item. And they said, what's that? And they said, we're waiting for the chopsticks. Well, what they failed to realize, and this is one of the downsides of using voice, they didn't order chopsticks. They wanted a case of chapstick for the people out in the field. Okay? So my proposal is that for logistical things, when you have long lists of things like that, that it's best to not be done in voice. So we have some other opportunities to do that. Uh, digital modes, and you know, the, I guess the original digital mode was CW. I did learn my five words a minute to get my my novice. Uh, I was thankful when I retested in 2010 that I didn't need to know code because I'd forgotten all five words a minute and I, I can at least recognize the uh, call sign of the local repeater that I use when it self-identifies, but not a whole lot beyond that. Um, and of course, those of you who use CW, I, I respect you greatly because one of the nice things about CW is it is such a great user of precious RF spectrum. And so I, I hope it never goes away. There are other digital modes for those of us who are CW dumb. And that would be, that would include things like PSK. Uh, that was my first introduction to digital modes after I got relicensed in MT63. And there's a number of other modes. Uh, once I finally downloaded FL Digi, I found there were lots of modes I never even heard of before. Uh, but there's a lot of things out there to play with. And that's one of the nice things about amateur radio is all the different avenues you can go explore. And I think those digital modes are really important when we do emergency communication. Obviously, PSK is also a good user of Spectrum. I don't personally know how MT63 is. Is it pretty good as far as uh, Spectrum use? It's fair. OK. That's reasonable. All right, but there's other, lots of other modes. And I'm not going to go into all those because we're here, to, we're here to talk about a specific thing today. All right, and that's WinLink. Uh, don't, just because I'm such a cheerleader, I don't want you to think that I think that WinLink is a cure-all for all your communications needs. It isn't. And I would never, if I'm trying to convince a jurisdiction or a hospital to use it, I'm saying it's a tool. It's not the tool. So uh, every tool has its use and its limitations, and we'll look at a few of those. So it does have numerous advantages. Now, for those of you who identified yourself in this group, here's the slide for you tonight, okay? If you go away with nothing else tonight, you memorize what's on this slide, then you can say, I learned something tonight, all right? In a nutshell, 
Winlink is global email via radio. We'll get more into what that really means, but if you just think about your normal email account, how you use the internet, now we're going to introduce using radio to do all or part of that. It has its roots in the maritime. Uh, so you're out on the ocean in your yacht, and you're sailing to Lisbon, Portugal, and your family's all back here, and there's a great big storm comes through. You survive it just fine, your boat's fine, you're gonna be able to continue your trip. You'd really like to let your family know that I'm okay, everything's cool, we're moving on. And so you could use WinLink to send that message back home from the middle of the ocean. It, it's used UHF, VHF, and HF. Now let's take a look at the system. So, so those of you who didn't know what WinLink was at all, now you know something about WinLink. So you're good, you're good to go for the evening. And if you have to leave, well, I guess that's, I'll have to deal with that. But anyway, let's look at the system. All right, so I made up this little chart. How am I going to get out of the way of everybody? Can I go over here? I don't want to cause feedback in this speaker. Um, the top line there just says WinLink system. That's not actually part of an org chart. It's just a label for this graphic. The second row is a row of what's called common message servers. Uh, spread around the world are servers that provide a repository for a WinLink message. So again, we'll talk about the specific connection later, but we send a message through WinLink. It goes up to, the, to one of these common message servers. The theory in their building of this worldwide system is we can have widespread outages of the internet, but we're not gonna have a worldwide outage all at the same time. So one or more of these servers will always be up and they, they back up one another through their internet connection. Now you'll notice they're in San Diego, California, Brentwood, Tennessee, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Vienna, Austria, and Perth, Australia. And I know you've all noticed the X through Brentwood, right? Sometime recently, and Lee might know more about this than I do, they did take the Brentwood uh, server offline. So basically, if you connect to WinLink, the WinLink system today, you're going to be connected indirectly to one of those four servers. That's all about to change. That's an accurate picture today as of, and I don't know if Halloween is, there's any significance to the fact that they're making a change on Halloween, but as of the 31st of this month, they're going to replace that with the Amazon Web Services. And now I'm not an expert on that stuff, and there's probably plenty of people in the room who are, but I'm told that's a better way for them to go, and obviously the WinLink development team thinks so, so that's what we're gonna get. So on November 1st, if I make a WinLink connection, I'm probably not gonna see that my, I'm connected to Perth or, yeah, WinLink Wednesday, that'll be fun. Okay, we'll, we'll get to there. So anyway, below that we have the, the internet. And I know that that Amazon Web, Cloud, Web Services Cloud is really part of the internet, but I'm just trying to show the layers of the, how the WinLink system works. So whereas the common message servers use the internet to update one another and, and basically mirror the same information on all the servers, that's uh, the connection between uh, the next level down. So we're, we have the four boxes where we have K7BC10, we have N2LEE, and other RMS. Those, that level is what we call radio message servers. And that's, that's the part that we'll interact with as users, and they will accept a message over the radio and inject it into the internet email system, and that's how that part works. The next level down, of course, is the part in between us as individual end users and the WinLink system. So the, those of us down the bottom line, I'm um, down there, you're down there under your station, or unless you want to be other station, you can be what you want to be. Uh, but that's, that's the basic structure. You'll see uh, all are part of this slide a little later too, as we talk about a few specifics. So let's move on. I promised you that I'd tell you that there are some limitations to WinLink. So as all of you already would know, if you use WinLink in a UHF or VHF environment, you are limited by your proximity to a, to a gateway. A gateway is an RMS station that is set up to receive your message via radio and then inject it into the internet system, or the internet email system for upload to the, serv the common message servers. So if you can't reach a gateway, you're, you're either out of luck or you're fortunate enough to be able to, to connect to that gateway through a digipeter, okay? 
If you use it on HF, those of you who use HF know we're really dependent on what the band conditions will allow us to do. And so you have to be flexible. Like I said, it's not a cure-all. Another limitation is that the Winlink system limits you to 120 kilobytes maximum message size. And that's the message itself and any attachments. It's not great, but if all the other systems have failed, it's better than, you know, writing it on a napkin and sending somebody to run down to Richmond on their bicycle or something. Now we've got to ask, well, what about throughput? We all know that we've got some limitations on our, on our throughput for digital modes. So I did not create this chart. Um, there's a gentleman in Florida by the name of Gordon Gibby. He is an electrical engineer, and then he decided that wasn't enough, so he decided to become a medical doctor. Uh, and he does a bunch of other things, but in addition to the, those things, he plays with Winlink, and he's done a lot of testing. And uh, his, his philosophy is this. Accurate throughput is what's critical. So, you know, PSK is an easy thing for somebody to learn, but we all know that it has no error correction, right? So sometimes you get gobbledygook, but you can usually figure out what the message was uh, through the context. But if we're communicating for an emergency, you really don't want to have to try and figure out what it is by the context. You might get chopsticks or something when you didn't want them. <laughs> so he's done some specific testing. I have not tested that. I created this chart from his data. His claim is, if you're going to use voice to communicate emergency information, your limitation is primarily the accurate typing speed of the person at the receiving end. And so his belief is about 30 words a minute is about the most that somebody could actually keep up for any sustained length of time. So if you had a message that was a, a thousand words long, it might be a challenge you know, to sustain that. His claim is that MT63 is about six times, or sorry, yeah, six times that fast. I'm not a personal user of MT63. This is his data. Also, I want to point out that the information on this chart, his claim is this is under ideal conditions, OK? Talks about Winmore, which is one of the two, win, one of the two major Winlink modes. He thinks that about 1,000 words a minute uh, for transmission. And the, nice, the interesting thing about Winlink is when you make a connection, there's some overhead at the beginning to do, establish the handshake. There's some overhead at the end to do the kiss and goodbye. In between where the message is transferred is where the action happens that we care about. And his claim is, and I think it's probably correct, when you have a longer message, your, through, your overall throughput goes up because you have one handshake at each end as opposed to a bunch of handshakes after short messages. Uh, I have not tested that. I can tell you that I sent out a, uh, a message yesterday afternoon, and it was, a, it was a net report and roster of all the people that checked into my net. And if I print it on my home printer at nine points or 10 points, it's about a three-page document. When I sent that message out uh, Thursday night over HF in mediocre conditions, it took six minutes and two seconds to send a message that was 1,073 words long. So that works out to about 178 words a minute. Still a lot better than I could ever type. So again, it's not that fast, but it's reliable because you have 100% error correction. And of course, if I had a lot more money to spend, and I don't think I've been good enough to get a Pactor 3 modem for Christmas, um, the throughput is uh, even better, lots better, maybe someday. All right, so we've talked about some of the limitations. Let's talk about the advantages. It does have a familiar interface, which you will get to see here momentarily. It's portable. In fact, once I got Winlink put on my computer, and I can't pull it out right now because i got a microphone in the way, I have a thumb drive. I copy the entire folder that's, that contains the WinLink program on my computer, put it on a thumb drive. If my computer dies, I can plug my thumb drive into your computer, configure out the outputs just a little bit, and I'm ready to go. I've got all my messages. So it's nice and portable that way. It's bi-directional with regular email. Now, PSK is cool because I can talk to you if you're using PSK and we're on the same frequency at the same time. WinLink Yes, there can be times when it's important that we both be on the same frequency at the same time. But one of the beautiful things about WinLink is I can send a WinLink message to another ham radio operator who's using WinLink. I can also send a WinLink message to anybody in the world who has a regular email address. So if I'm out in, uh, when I was out in California thinking, man, when that big earthquake comes, there's not going to be anybody to talk to around here. If I had to, I could, on behalf of my local EOC, I could send a message to the regular email address for the California governor. 
And the beauty is he could even reply. And he's not violating part 97 because when he sends a reply email through the regular internet email system, it picks it up and gets onto the WinLink common message servers. And then the only person who's doing any transmitting is the person at the other end when I make my connection to check for mail. And that's an amateur radio operator. So that's a really nice feature of WinLink. It can be internet independent, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. We've already hinted that, you know, I can send a message to a regular email address. Obviously, we're using the internet for that connection. It also includes, and I know you can do FL message uh, within FL Digi, and I haven't played with that. Uh, but the nice thing about WinLink is it's got forms built in, and it's forms that uh, agencies who are doing emergency management or emergency response, they're accustomed to seeing those forms. We're going to look a little bit at that later as well. Anybody know what that is? Excuse me? It's an ICS-213 form. Now, it's nice and small on screen. I didn't intend for you to have to read anything, but you can see that there's up at the, maybe the top quarter of it, there's a section for doing uh, addressing and subject matter. Then the bigger box in the upper half is the actual body of the message. And the lower blank spot is where a reply message can go. If you're doing, if you're helping any emergency management organization, even if it's the Red Cross or your local EOC, even the fire department, they're probably used to seeing an ICS-213. Its common name is a general message form. So everybody who does emergency management uses this form. They're very accustomed to seeing it. If we can provide that to them, that gives them a comfort level of what we're able to do for them. This form is easily available online as a, as a fillable Word document. And you can attach that Word document to a WinLink message and get it to your end user. Challenge is, it's a sev that message right there is a 74 kilobyte document as a Word doc. Well, also, not everybody has Word, right? Or a Word reader or some other compatible. So a lot of people would say, well, let's turn it into a PDF because everybody and their brother can read a PDF. And you can turn that into a PDF. But in this particular case, that turns it into a 107 kilobyte document. So we're pushing the threshold. We're below the threshold of the WinLink system, but you don't have to push it to the threshold if you don't really have to. So let's look at one of the built-in forms that WinLink has is, is an ICS-213. It looks a little different, but you can see at the top it has basic areas for filling in the to and from, the incident name, and then we have this section here where we talk about the, uh, where we have the message. This is the exact same message that I had typed into the other form. And then uh, approved by and the position, something they want at the bottom of a, an ICS-213 form. This message section will expand as necessary to uh, whatever the length of your message is. This is an HTML form. So when you bring it up in WinLink, it brings up a web browser tab and you just fill in all the boxes. You hit the submit button. It creates an attachment to your WinLink message. And that particular message is 1.2 kilobytes, including this attachment. Now, the nice part about it is when you send it to a WinLink user, they can bring it up on screen. It will look just like that. They can show it to their served agency, and they'll say, yeah, that's an ICS-213. And then you can print it to look just like that. But if you send it to a non-WinLink user at their regular email address, all of that data will be there in an organized text-based message. So the message still gets through. All right, I told you it had a familiar interface. This is my Microsoft Outlook inbox. Probably most of you have seen a box similar to that. And it has a few constant features. I know you can organize it the way you want, but we have a ribbon menu up here with some icons. We have a text-based menu up on the top. We have some folders over here on the left. We have a list of the messages here at the top center. And if you choose to display it, you can have a message preview down here. Everybody pretty familiar with that? We're good? All right. Here's what the WinLink Express main window, or in this case, in my inbox, looks like. So again, we have some text menus at the top. We have an icon menu right below it. We have some folders over here, a list of my messages, and then the highlighted message is displayed right here at the bottom of the screen. Pretty darn familiar. So the learning curve for that piece of it is just not very difficult. Now we're going to send a message. So we're going to focus on this part I've circled here. So we zoom in and we see we want to create a message. So how do we do that? We just select from the menu. 
or we can select from the icons and we click on either one of those to create a new message and then a, a message creation or message editing window pops up on top. Looks a lot like a message you might generate from Outlook, doesn't it? So once we get to this, we just enter a few things. We can enter a two, we have a two line, we also have a courtesy copy line. We can enter as many in there as we need to. We enter a subject, please always enter a subject. I don't care whether you're using Outlook or WinLink, but if you want your recipient to ever find your message, especially for somebody who receives a bunch of messages every month, I can find it if you give me a subject, but if you don't, I'm griping while I'm looking for it. And of course, then your message body down here. Just pretty standard stuff. Now we're going to prepare that message for actual sending. So we're going to focus on this area of the screen next. I'm going to zoom in and we see that here's where we After you've composed your Outlook message, you can click the send button. Sorry. There is no send button in, in, in WinLink and that's because we haven't made any connection, right? You're sitting there with Outlook on. You're always connected to the internet. You push send, off it goes. Not so with WinLink. So what we have to do, instead of clicking send, we're going to click post to Outbox. Once you do that, you'll get another, uh, that the message creation window will disappear and you'll be returned to your inbox. So what we have here is right now I'm looking at the, at the outbox. It says I have one message. Here's the message highlighted. There's a preview of, of the text. Let's zoom in and take a look here. All right, so what we find is I have one message in my outbox, which we see there. When it, as soon as we posted it to the outbox, it was given a date and time stamp, and it was given a unique serial number, which might come in handy if you're ever looking for some message you thought you lost. Okay, but it does that. Now we go back to the, to the organizational chart for the WinLink system, and we're gonna focus on this part here. Now the reason we're gonna focus on this part here is because as end users, this is the only part we really interact with, right? All that stuff that happens with Amazon Web Services and the, and the common message servers today, as an end user, you don't even see that. It's, it's magic as far as you're concerned from the time you send your message. So we're going to concentrate on this part down here. And what's going to happen is, let's see, where did I go with the next one? Okay, I'm going to stay here. So what's going to happen here is if I'm going to send this message, then I'm going to start a session and transmit my message. If I'm doing packet, I'm going to probably select a gateway like this. If I'm doing HF, I'm probably going to select Lee's gateway here and we'll talk a little bit about more about those differences here in a few minutes. So what I did is I did create uh, a couple of uh, short videos for you. We'll see if my system is going to be play nice with that. Uh, I guess I'm not there yet. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. So what we're gonna do, I'll just sit here for a moment. <laughs> I'm going to have to attend my computer here. Um, so we're at the outbox and we're looking at the big, the main screen and we're going to focus on this area right up here. And what happens is uh, WinLink wants to know how we're going to interact with the WinLink system. So in this case, if I'm going to send it over VHF, I'm going to select a packet WinLink session and I'm going to do that through that drop down menu. Once I've selected the session type that I want, then I'm going to click this, uh, the words open session to actually open the session that we care about that will pop up another window. And in that window, we get a little bit of information that says, okay, I've started the session. I'm now going to start talking to my TNC. And once it initializes the TNC, it tells you that it's ready to go. And once it does that, you push the start button and then the magic starts to happen. So what I have here, let's see if this is going to work for us. I hope the volume is still good. This is about a minute long. I'm just going to let it run. I know you can't really read what's happening, but you're going to see a couple things graphically. A couple things are going to happen. We're going to see some information here as the session progresses. As the message comes in, it's going to uh, present us a green bar showing the progress of our message. And then when it's done, we're going to see a new message show up in bold in our inbox. So I'm going to go ahead and run that video.
finally disconnects. Yeah, it does. So, you might have noticed that the actual message transfer, the green bar, it happened pretty quickly. All right, so see how there's that all that overhead for the beginning handshake and the kiss and goodbye at the end, right? Now, what I've done, um, because you couldn't read any of that stuff, I did create one more video, and this one is a close-up of that session screen. I'm going to attempt to stop it in a couple places and just explain what you're seeing. But let's start that one. Here's what's happened here. We already saw that uh, it had awakened my TNC and was talking to it. Let me get out of the way. Can you make that full screen? And that's as big as I can do with that particular capture. Um, that's all I can do. Sorry. So uh, let me just point out a few things. It tells me that it's connect. It's attempting to connect to this gateway AA4WC-10, and it reports that it's connected. I get the welcome message from that gateway. It tells me what version of the software that gateway is using. It tells me that I'm connected to the Scotia Common Message Server. It says that it's talking to me. It reports my version of the software. But the important thing that we care about is this FF right here. That tells us that it's asking to check for messages. See if there's any mail waiting for me. Now, it has said, yes, there is an encapsulated message. Here is the serial number of that message that we saw in the outbox. Not, not that particular one, but it's, it's the message that is waiting to be retrieved by me. It tells me it's approximate uncompressed and compressed size. The next thing that you and I care about is this FSY. It means that my system is configured to automatically say, yes, please download that message. Here. So you see it's receiving the message. The green bar is not displayed here. I mean, the green bar is not displayed in this particular one, but it, you saw how quickly it downloaded the message. When it was done downloading the message, we get another FF saying, hey, are there any more messages waiting for me? And then the FQ tells me, no, there's not. And so once I get an FQ, I know that my system is going to go through the disconnect procedure. And that's what it does here. And it reports a disconnect right there. So that's, that session is finished. So that was kind of a close-up of, of what, it had seen, what you'd seen in the previous slide. Okay, so back to this slide where we've seen the overview of the system. Let me just go back one. So we cared about, what we did is we, from my station, RF through the atmosphere to a gateway, not this particular one in this case, connection through the internet to one of those common message servers, and my message was actually downloaded in a reverse order from that. All right? That's, that was a demonstration of the packet winlink on the VHF side. The HF side is very similar, so in this case you wouldn't use a packet gateway, but I've been known to use Lee's gateway on HF on 80 meters, uh, and there are times in the day when it's pretty ideal for me to get the, what, 60 mile jump from my place in the Shenandoah Valley to his place. So I'm not going to show you a session video for that because it really, it's doing the same thing, okay? That was VHF. I was connecting to the call sign AA4WC, which is a gateway that's about a mile and a half from my house. That, through his, in, uh, through his I won't call it permanent, but we know nothing's permanent, internet connection, he pulled the servers and it happened to connect him to the one in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So, again, as, see, as an end user, I really don't have to care about that part up the top. If, if I can reach that gateway and he can reach the internet, then I'm good to go. So on the, on the HF side, we call it, it's a Winmore connection. And so we commonly use Winmore in, in the HF realm. 
Um, those who have plenty of money can use the more efficient pack door, and it's a different session type within WinLink, but it's the same basic process. Um, the difference is when we choose the type of session we're going to do, then instead of the, the Winmore Win, or instead of packet, we're going to select Winmore WinLink from the drop down list. And again, pack door is one of those selections, and there's a couple others as well. Here's where I believe WinLink's true strengths lie, and that's in its ability to be internet independent. So when there's no internet at my location, so remember I talked about the sale, you're out there on your yacht in the middle of the Atlantic, you don't have an internet connection, unless you're paying for satellite, but you know, generally you're not going to. But your family back home has an internet connection, then they, they can, you can send by doing HF to a gateway some long distance away from you and be able to get your message delivered to home. And of course they can reply and the next time you check through uh, using HF Winmore or WinLink, uh, you can get your message. So when you're missing win, uh, internet at one end of the path, that's a good thing. It's also good if you're missing it at both ends of the path. Now another closer to home example of, of not having internet at one end of the path. Let's say we have this uh, disaster roll through Warren County, Virginia, and my emergency manager wants me to get a message to Richmond, but all of our communications are down. Well, Richmond may still have internet connection. That's okay. I can still send using HF Winmore. I can send a message to a gateway, whether it's Lee's gateway over here, or uh, I routinely will use a gateway that's near Boston, Massachusetts, or another one that's in southeastern Wisconsin. Wherever the bands will allow me to get at that time of day, that will still get in injected into the internet email system, and the, and the EOC in Richmond will still get it. If Richmond and us, Richmond and we would be the proper term, I think, both have no internet, now you think, uh oh, how are we going to do it? We set up what's called a peer-to-peer -peer session. And that eliminates the internet entirely from, from the equation. All I have to do is know that Richmond is going to be on this particular frequency at this particular time and choose that same frequency at that time frame and send a message directly radio to radio. Let's see. Um, so on that previous part of the chart, it was just our, uh, my station. RF, not to N2LEE or K7BC.10, but directly to your station, for example. And that's one of the things we do on WinLink Wednesday is we allow people to test their peer-to-peer -peer capabilities. WinLink has some practical uses in emergency communications. Uh, in October 2012, off the coast of North Carolina, a replica ship of the HMS Bounty was going down in a storm. I don't even know if it was a storm. It was going down. So they attempted to make contact to get rescue. They tried their satellite phone, didn't get, couldn't get anybody. They tried the maritime mobile service net on what, 14300. For some reason, they could not reach anybody. They used WinLink, got the message through, and 14 of their 16 on board were saved. More recently, in September of this year, Hurricane Maria did a number on Puerto Rico. You guys probably remember hearing about that. It's maybe not in the news, but they're still really struggling down there to pull things together. You might also remember that Red Cross has an affiliation with ARRL and they asked for the most help they've ever asked for before. Um, they asked for 50 volunteers to go down there. In 12 hours after they posted the announcement, they had 300 people willing to go. One of the requirements to go was to be uh, functional with WinLink. And you might even know that someone that you know personally, Craig, N0CSM, was one of the 50. And he was down there doing what he could, sending situation reports, sending uh, safe and well information over the radio back to the mainland. In fact, uh, there was a couple of stations in, there was a station in Mexico, and there was a station in Texas that actually pointed some beams toward Puerto Rico to help those folks that were down there uh, to get their messaging out. Craig sent me a few, uh, personal notes of, of uh, what was going on on the ground there, and it was pretty enlightening, and it certainly was not anything like what we were hearing on the news. So it was, it was nice to hear it from an insider. So anyway, your own Craig McVeigh was part of the force of 50. Maybe it was really Craig in a force of 49. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, packet peer-to-peer -peer can be used also on both VHF and HF. And what we do is, again, when we ask for a session type, we just from the pull-down menu, just choose 
uh, packet peer-to-peer. -peer. I'm sorry, I'm trying to stay out of your way so you can see the slides. Uh, other than that, you open the session, everything happens just like it did before, except that instead of using the internet, you're going directly to that other station. Winmore is, again, the HF side of this equation. Same process, it's, it's used pretty regularly, and all we do is we select a different session type. We select Winmore peer-to-peer, -peer, and you use the appropriate antenna and frequencies, and it all happens the same basic way. So Winlink uses a um, propagation software, and I can't ever remember the, all the letters in its name, ITSHFBC or something like that. It's, it was a government production that um, we can use for free. And what it does is it, when you set up WinLink on your computer, you tell it which grid square you're in. And then when you pull up a list of available stations for you, it will list all the stations that have these gateways. If, if you're doing it on VHF, they're just going to list the stations that are within like 150 kilometers of you. When, they, when you pull up the list of HF stations, it basically lists them all. But using that propagation software, it does an estimate of which stations you're likely to be able to reach given the time of day and the solar conditions. And so if you just select one that's in the, uh, in the green or with the higher probability numbers, those are the ones that a you session is in to or when, when, it, when an HF Winmore session is in progress, uh, it pops up a little um, sound card TNC on screen, and it has a little spectrum display. So if I select, I want to connect to Lee's Gateway on HF, I tune my radio to that frequency, I look at my waterfall on that, on that spectrum display, and I see that there's traffic. I can see it within the passband. Yeah, and well, you can also hear it most times too. I mean, it's not terribly unlike what we heard on the packet session. So, and we experience this every Wednesday when we do our peer-to-peer -peer sessions. So people kind of have to wait until it's, somebody's done with me. And then, so if, if I tune up to him and he's busy, I just wait. I can tell when the station signs off. I can tell when his station signs off. And then I can oh. jump in and And, and the, the system tells me which frequency to tune to for him. And I, I know that he's always going to be at that frequency, unless, like he said, he changes frequency for some reason. But then his system will notify the system that he's on. Again, when we're doing peer-to-peer, -peer, I'm going from my station through the atmosphere to your station, vice versa. And we eliminate the Internet entirely. So you, know, you can see that in an Internet out situation, this is a good method. All right. So there are some challenges with peer-to-peer. -peer. You have to remember what... Uh, what WinLink does is it defaults to a particular type of message. It usually defaults to a WinLink message. And so on WinLink Wednesday, when, when, when people are trying to connect to me and I see that they're failing, they, get a, they connect and then they immediately disconnect. My first hint is they probably forgot to say that they were sending me a peer-to-peer -peer message. And that's a, an easy correction for them. All right, pretty simple. How do we connect to the WinLink system? We need a radio. I'm thinking everybody's got one of those, right? And a computer. Most of you probably have one of those. Hopefully, for the sake of WinLink, it needs to be a Windows platform. Obviously, if you're an Apple user or a Linux user, there are emulators. I know maybe one or two guys that have made it work with Linux. Uh, I don't see that there's a, a, a push to get it ported over there right now, but it can be done. And you need an interface. Of course, that can be a TNC. You know, a lot of people use a KPC 3 Plus. I, I also have a uh, a genuine TNC-X from uh, Coastal Chipworks that works very well, and of course a signal link. One of the advantages of the signal link is I can make it work on both HF and VHF. Software. We've got to have a program. The client software is called WinLink Express. It's a free download and it's well supported, and I say that because they're always doing improvements. If somebody find, They've got a lot of people who are willing to test the beta, beta versions, and they get a lot of feedback, and they make uh, fairly regular updates to the program, and they update the forms pretty frequently as well. All right, obviously we can't go into configuration issues tonight. There are people around you who are WinLink users who could help you. I might be able to help you. There's just too many possibilities, a different radio, different computer. I, from my house, I can try to help you, but the Elmer's the way to go. I mean, I've helped a few people through chatting on uh, Facebook Messenger, and I've had some hour-long phone calls too, but we've, so we, Working together, we can generally get you help and helped and get you going. So if you need to contact me, you can use my ARRL address. You can also contact me at my WinLink account. And in WinLink, if you're sending it from a regular email address, it's just kw6gb at winlink.org. Or if you're sending me a message from WinLink, it's just kw6gb. Of course, if you're sending it to me through WinLink, you probably don't even need my help. You've got it figured out already. All right. 
I told you I moved here from California. I was using it in California because I figured when that big earthquake hit, I wasn't going to be able to communicate with anybody close by. So I was using uh, the Winmore side on HF and sending messages up near Stockton in Sacramento, California, or over to uh, Nevada. Uh, when I came to Virginia, I found that most people were using it locally, and there were a number of gateway, VHF gateways around me, and there weren't a lot of people doing uh, HF stuff. Well, because the, wind, the signal link was the first interface I bought, I had a dickens of a time getting it properly configured to work on the VHF side. Now I've got that all sorted out, and it all works nicely. I didn't know of people who were using it regionally, uh, I suspect there were, I just didn't know of them. But I found that the people who I did know that were using it weren't using it on a regular basis. So remember when I, earlier when we talked about, unlike Outlook, you can't just press a send button, you have to remember to start a session. And I found that people that didn't use it on a regular basis forgot some of those little nuances and they'd forget to do it. So I thought, how in the world am I going to get people to use it regularly? I found out about a net in Wisconsin that had a weekly WinLink net, and so I stole the idea. And the next thing you know, WinLink Wednesday is born. Okay? WinLink Wednesday is a net that I run. Uh, on the, in late August of last year, I put out a posting on the uh, Aries Races of Virginia Facebook page saying, hey, I'm going to have this one-time net. I want to see how it works out. And any time during Wednesday, you can send me a message. One of the things I like about that is, you know, there's a number of nets all over, and whether they're VHF or HF. We have an Odin net on every other Monday night or first and third Monday nights in the state of Virginia. Some people don't participate, and I, some of the complaints I hear is, oh, that net's during my commute or that net's during my dinner time, and I can't participate. So WinLink Wednesday is an all-day net, so any time during the 24 hours that Virginia calls Wednesday, you can participate. So I had this one-time net. I got 16 responses. I was sufficiently encouraged, I decided to make it a weekly net, and we've, we've had a net every week since then. I think I've missed three, and my good friend Lyle Piner, N4ACK, down in uh, uh, Windsor, Virginia, has been kind enough to be in backup net control for those. And so we've managed to make it grow a little bit. In fact, in the first year, it grew from 16 in the first week to uh, like 79 there in that last week. Now, the reason the lines diverge is the red, uh, Right about in here, the, in uh, early October of 16, I decided let's make it a little more interesting and let's allow people to do a peer-to-peer. -peer. So what happens where the lines diverge is you'll see that some people will send a, a regular WinLink message through the internet system and others will check in peer-to-peer -peer with me. So what I do is I have in the morning from like 7.30 to 9.30, I have a peer-to-peer -peer session and I announce I'll be on this frequency in this mode during these hours and you can send in your message. I do a very similar thing in the evening. If the bands will support it, I try to do it in the afternoon as well. So the blue line represents on each given week the total number of check-ins that I receive for the net. And of course, since some guys do both methods, that's why the red line's a little lower. We set records on October 11th. I had a total of 91 check-ins from 62 unique participants. And so, the fact that I'm running that, I don't care. What I want to do is I want to see more people using WinLink, and we've seen good growth. from. And you can see from each icon represents one particular person. In this particular case, the blue icons with the blue text indicate that it was a peer-to-peer -peer check in and the red icon with the yellow text indicates that it was a uh, R, what we call RMS check-in. They went through a gateway. So we have fairly good coverage on the state, and uh, people are pretty faithful about it. And some people look forward to it so much that uh, I had one guy post on Facebook, when are you going to open the peer-to-peer -peer session, Greg? And then he realized it was still Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so how's WinLink being used in, in Virginia right now? Um, nothing official. Everything about WinLink Wednesday is, is, has no sanctioning from the state or ARL or anybody. I just wanted to encourage people, like I told you earlier, I'm a cheerleader for WinLink. I wanted to encourage people to use it on a regular basis and become competent. So there's nothing official going on, but last year in Warren County, we were able to use WinLink in a packet peer-to-peer -peer session. When Page County was doing its set, we set up in our EOC with my Go box in a packet peer-to-peer, -peer, and we were simulating being the Virginia EOC, and so they were sending situation reports and requests for supplies and things like that to us through WinLink packet peer-to-peer. Um, we're working with our county emergency management office in, in Warren County. Uh, we have permanent antennas established at two fire stations that are pre-designated as shelters. 
So when we send our CERT team out to operate a shelter, we can send an amateur radio operator with them, kind of embedded in with the CERT team, and they can communicate both voice and data back from the, from the shelter. So it, it's voice and data. We use WinLink extensively for that. We've also set up with our local hospital, and we can do the same thing there. So we have a net every Sunday night. About once a month, we try and do our net from our deployment locations, and we go out to those fire stations in the hospital and, and test those abilities. Virginia EOC. This is a, an interesting quandary, but we're working our way through it. Uh, most of you know about the Odin A net. Who knows about the D net? Do you know about the D net? Uh, it's, the way it's published is it's supposed to use Olivia 4500. And since I've been in Virginia since June of 2014, I've never heard it being used in, in Olivia 4500 in that net. In fact, the net is really, like I say up here, fits and starts. Sometimes it's active, sometimes it's not. They've mostly been using PSK31, which, uh, you know, okay, it can at least make a connection. But the problem is there, a lot of people want to participate in nets, but they don't want to take the responsibility of being the net control. And so that's kind of fallen by the wayside. However, uh, I was reminded today by my contact at, at VDEM that WinLink is actually its preferred, well, actually only digital mode. So if we want to connect with uh, the Virginia EOC, Using WinLink and getting used to it is a good thing to do. Of course, how do we do that? Well, I told you earlier we had these built-in forms. When you select the forms uh, option in WinLink, you get this pop-down menu, and your configuration will look exactly like mine, except that instead of my call sign, it will show yours. And you see there's plus signs, which means there's more stuff. And so when you expand that standard templates, you see this entire list of forms. And there's, there's uh, ARRL forms, but the common ones, of course, are the ICS forms, the ICS 213 being the most common. It's built into WinLink. They update it. If, there's a pro, you know, if somebody finds a glitch in it, they, the team is really good about updating it. And so we use that. We can send an ICS 213 directly to the Virginia EOC. You might remember early in the presentation I mentioned Web EOC, and Virginia uses Web EOC. They have a... a where a jurisdiction, if, so if Warren County wanted to report this situation that's occurring in their county, there's a, that's a page that's got about 50 inputs, um, and probably 20 of them or 15 of them might be required inputs. So if we lose internet, how are we going to get that information to the VEOC? Well, the way we do it is, I decided, let's create a form for Virginia. For Virginia. Well, there's a member of the WinLink development team that does all their forms development. But when I saw all the inputs that the Web EOC form wants us to use, I couldn't just throw that on him. So I sat with my emergency manager. He logged into Web EOC for me, and I, I made a list for myself of all the potential inputs, you know, all the, because uh, uh, some of them are verbose inputs and others are a specific set of, of inputs that you can choose from. So I made a list of all those things. I've done some HTML coding in the past the hard way using Notepad. Uh, so I got the basics down, and I created the HTML form for the input side, created the HTML for the output side, as well as the text form that uh, puts that information into the body of a WinLink message. And uh, when I got it close, and I was happy it was displaying properly for me, I was brave enough at that point to send it off to Mike Burton, uh, the head of the WinLink uh, form, or he's the WinLink forms manager. And um, he was able to clean up a couple of my coding errors and made a couple of visual changes to make it easier to read. And he said, I like the form, Greg. Let's publish it as part of the regular standard templates within WinLink. And I said, that's a great idea, but hold off for just a minute, if you would, please. I've involved my emergency manager in this from the start. I don't want to just suddenly put him out of, the, out of the equation and just go publish this thing. So I made a courtesy call to him, and he said, sure, go with it. So we now have, in the standard WinLink templates, a form called the Virginia Local Sit Rep. So it's a situation report from a locality. So if we don't have internet, we can open up this form in WinLink, fill it out on behalf of our emergency management, and send it off to Richmond, and they get it. Tomorrow, I'm actually doing a test with them because it's, uh, I've sent a few WinLink messages with this attached, but tomorrow I'm actually doing a peer-to-peer -peer test with them. Uh, a nice way to test it. In fact, there's some instructions in the form that I've prepared for the WinLink or the radio operator to print that form, take it to the watch officer that's on duty, and then point out some specific instructions to ask him to call, email, or text my emergency manager. 
and my emergency manager and I aren't even talking tomorrow. So if I send this message, they deliver it, print it, show it to the guy, he texts or calls my emergency manager, my emergency manager thinks we got a home run. So that is now available for any WinLink user around the world and maybe other part of Mike Burton's thing at wanting to publish it was he was hoping that other jurisdictions might want to do something similar. So we've learned that WinLink is pretty easy. Uh, it's inexpensive and it's versatile. We can send peer-to-peer -peer messages, we can send messages to non-hams, and we can have attachments. A lot of the useful ones are already built in. So as we move forward, I'm going to encourage you don't wait for an emergency. Learn to use it now. Practice it on a regular basis. So join WinLink Wednesday. You know, 350 to 400 messages a month is just not enough for me. Plus, generating that map and keeping every call sign legible, <laughs> there's no challenge in it. There is actually in some of the more populated areas, this being one of them, Virginia Beach the other. And so by doing that, you'll be competent when we need to do it, when we need to use it in an emergency. Nobody wants to learn to change a tire when it's two o'clock in the morning and it's snowing out, right? Um, and of course, I'm gonna ask you to spread the word. So I'll just leave you with these questions. How will you use WinLink? Think about ways that you could use it to serve uh, a served agency, whether it be the Red Cross, your local emergency management, or a hospital, uh, fire and rescue department, I'm working with 13 hospitals in the Shenandoah Valley right now to put uh, identical data and voice, including WinLink capabilities in each of their facilities. And of course, it gives us an opportunity to develop and foster relationships so that when they need us, they know they can call us and they know they can depend on us. So I know it was long. I covered a lot of stuff. I do want to thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, are there any questions we haven't answered? Guess we covered it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.